Hello, and welcome back to Real Seekers. I'm your host, Dale the Real Seeker. And um, today we have something uh, a little bit different in the Shroud Wars series. So this is going to be the first of what I'm going to be calling the Shroud Wars panel discussion. So um, originally I wanted to finish my Shroud solo shows and then uh, start up on these. Uh, due to circumstances, uh, we're going to go out of order a little bit. So I'm going to get uh, started with panel discussions, looking at my Shroud solo shows and, and getting feedback from the experts on a panel as to what they think about some of the arguments I made there, uh, what I did right, what I did wrong. Um, I can tell you I've got some updates. Uh, there are some things I, I want to update on my end. Um, but yeah, that's the plan for today. So kind of helping me out, I have uh, people who are not strangers to the show, but first uh, we'll start with Bob Rucker. Hey, Bob. Hello. Welcome back. This is your, I think your third time on the show, right? Uh, I don't keep count. Okay, <laughs> you're you're obviously a regular, so uh, cool. Yeah, so so Bob, why don't you kind of uh, tell the audience about what you've been up to since the last time you've been on the show? Um, well, uh, let's see. Uh, my my, what I'm doing is uh, research to try and solve the mysteries of the Shroud of Turin and presentations to try and communicate that. And so, uh, the pastor of the church that my wife and I attend, which is Calvary Chapel in Kennewick, Washington, uh, invited me to do a Wednesday evening service. So I spoke for an hour uh, and answered some of his questions. And we had maybe, oh, 100 people there uh, for a Wednesday evening service, which I thought was pretty good. Uh, but they, they enjoyed it uh, and benefited from it. Uh, and uh, as we were cleaning things up and putting things away, we, we encountered two, uh, two uh, girls that said, uh, that was great. We really appreciate that. Okay, so so then I, I talked with the children, 500 children in two different groups, uh, and I just enjoyed interacting with the children. And uh, I put a pick up a typical picture of Jesus, and I said, "Who is this?" And they said, "It's, it's Jesus." And then I asked, "Well, how do you know?" And they, they raised their hands, and I called on one boy, and he said, "Because it looks like Jesus." <laughs> so then we had to go into why we have the perception that that's how Jesus looks. And I think it's because of the Shroud of Turin. Uh, so that's what I spoke on uh, at, at our church and, and to our school associated with our church. But uh, what I'm doing now is, uh, and for the last several weeks, I'm setting up to do a, a full day Shroud conference uh, in a suburb of Phoenix, Arizona called Gilbert. Uh, this is the, the Christ Greenfield Church in Gilbert, Arizona, uh, and this is going to be November 12th, uh, and I'm going to speak uh, from uh, 8.30 in the morning to 5 in, in the evening, uh, and uh, we're going to go run through about uh, 280 PowerPoint slides in uh, six one-hour presentations. At least that's how I'm planning it at this point. Uh, I'm assuming that I can do that, uh, and I, just physically, uh, and, and so uh, we'll, we'll try and do the best we can. But that's going to be covering all, all the topics as best I can w within the limits of, of a one day conference. So that, that's what I'm doing. Uh, I've, I've made some, uh, you know, I, I have a hypothesis, the vertically collimated radiation burst hypothesis, and we can put acronym to, uh, to that uh, uh, VCRB hypothesis. Uh, and that is consistent with the evidence for three different things, which is a, which makes it a very good hypothesis. But when it's consistent with image formation, the carbon dating, uh, and how the blood that would have dried on the body is now on, on the cloth. So this is the first hypothesis that actually explains multiple um, mysteries of the shroud. And so it's a very attractive from a scientific standpoint uh, in that regard. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah, you've been doing doing great work on your end. So yeah. awesome. All right, cool. And uh, Bob sent me a while back, he sent me a bunch of new sources, um, as well as a video. So I'm going to put that in the blog for you guys. So, you know, go to check that out. Um, but my other guest is Hugh Ferry, uh, the Shroud Skeptic. Um, so yeah, Hugh, um, I want to turn it to you to, you know, what have you been up to? And I, I know there's a couple specific things you want to say as well. Yep. <clears throat> well, uh, most of the time what I do now is I do what I've been done, doing all the time, and that is look for primary sources 
for just about everything anybody ever says. So even if they start with, the shroud is a linen cloth, I think, how do they know? Who's actually I analyzed it? And, I, and I've been working on some interesting ideas, um, given that the warp of the shroud is almost all on one side and the weft of the shroud is almost all on the other. So that uh, 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 finding out what the composition is of weft threads is not easy using just the one side of the shroud. Uh, little things like that. But uh, I, I'm also responding because I am, as as I, I like to call myself, a, a non-authenticist or a medievalist. Um, and I, I'm not an anti-authenticist. Um, and I'm not an atheist. Like a lot of uh, people, I think the vast majority of people who are interested in the shroud and think it's medieval, uh, we, we're Christians. And looking through the comments that people make to blogs and podcasts and things like that, overwhelmingly, the response of the people who are non-authenticists are Christians. And a good, I would say, it's certainly a good 30 percent, and, and in some podcasts, even a big, a big majority, uh, are people who have one reason why they think the shroud is medieval. And it's because it disagrees with the Bible. Now, Bob and I both would never use that. Uh, it, Bob wouldn't necessarily use the Bible as a way of authenticating the shroud, and I certainly wouldn't use the Bible as a way of demonstrating that it was medieval. But it is a very prominent um, and significant proportion of people who don't believe in the shroud. That's their that's their 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 reason for it, and they're sometimes their only reason. Um, and then and there is a feeling uh, sometimes that uh, we 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 evil atheists, we don't want to know. We've, we've set our mind to it. We don't do any research. We're just locked on. And of course, this this couldn't be further from the truth. I'm just thinking um, there, there's myself, of course, a, a good Catholic. Uh, one of the biggest and most probably the best book, certainly on the history of the Shroud, uh, published recently is by Andrea Nicolotti, who's another good Catholic and also thinks the shroud is medieval uh, and then of course the um the 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 much debated blood pattern analysis paper uh which was headed uh mostly headed at least in an interview by luigi garlacelli who for all i know might be an atheist and is certainly a member of the italian version of um what do they call it in america psychop or something like that the the um, organization of skeptics but actually the lead author is matteo borini who is another Catholic. Uh, so I think if people want to um, attack or, or, or sort of disagree with people who think that the Shroud is medieval, they mustn't assume that they're evil out atheists out for the downfall of Christianity. <laughs> so that, that's one of one of my, my points that I wanted to mention. And then simply completely off the topic um, uh, uh, of myself and probably off what we're doing here, and that is that um, a straw horse that's often put up by people who think the shroud is um, authentic and they want to criticize people who think it's medieval is that they have in mind someone like Andy Warhol working by himself in an attic with a with a uh, you know an artist who sells his work to uh, to the highest bidder and, and if he painted a shroud and it worked why didn't he paint another one and all the rest of it whereas I think that shows a complete misunderstanding of what medieval artists were. Uh, although we know the names of uh, perhaps a dozen or so, of course, there were hundreds of artists who the word didn't exist. Uh, they were called artificers, artifacts in Latin. They were craftsmen. They were employed by rich people, palaces, cathedrals, abbeys to do art. And they didn't have a name. And what they did was their job. And so I don't think I'm I'm I, I don't think it's a, a good idea to imagine this this strange little man working in an attic and then coming up with an idea which he's then selling to the local noble. Um, I think he's a he's a chap, and they went right. We want a cloth that does this, and he went oh right okay I'll see what I can come up with, and and uh, and came up with the shroud. So I, I think if those ideas could be knocked on the head, and so you know the, uh, uh, and. Uh, People appreciate that there are plenty of very good Christians. I hope I'm a good Christian, certainly a Catholic, um, who think the shroud is medieval, and that the concept of the medieval artist as being a kind of uh, uh, yes, a, a, a modern artist. The only 
Hopper. We just had a, a big exhibition of of your your great American artist Hopper in England, which has been broadcast, uh, and and very lovely it was. But the medieval artist was nothing like that. He was a jobbing craftsman. So that's my introduction. Gotcha. Awesome. Uh, just and I'll just say Canadian here. Don't forget we got three. Oh yes, no, I know. No, it's Toronto. <laughs> very important. Um, all right, cool. So so Hugh, um, just one thing to ask you. So. I will admit, um, in terms of Christian opponents, even just today, um, I was responding to YouTube comments uh, of Christians saying a biblical objection. You know, the shroud contradicts John chapter 20, verse 7. Um, they were saying because, oh, the, the shroud was only covering up to the neck and then he had a, a separate napkin. But just to clarify for you, you don't think that the shroud is inconsistent with the biblical evidence. Like that's not an objection you have or... No, no, I don't think so. I mean, with respect to the good people of, of Arizona, Tennessee, and Southwards, um, the, the the word of God wasn't written by James the First of England. Um, uh, uh, that's a big shock to some of them, uh, and you have to understand the Greek, and you have to look at John in context uh, with the Synoptic Gospels, none of whom mention strips of linen. I mean, that's a very John thing. Um, and, and the same thing, uh, people often debate, you know, would, would Paul have said his thing about um, having long hair? Well, nobody knows how long, long hair is. Uh, probably Bob's got longer hair than I have, but that doesn't mean he's got long hair in any normal sense. And uh, uh, then what's the other thing that they go for? Isaiah, isn't it, who says that... Uh, uh, Jesus, or again, although, although it's a prophecy, it doesn't specify Jesus. It's thousands of years before Jesus lived. Uh, but that his face was so disfigured that you wouldn't be able to recognize him. And the shroud isn't disfigured enough for them to be for them to be convinced. And I just don't find that um, credible, really. <laughs> I don't think I don't think there's sensible objections. Awesome. Yeah, no, that, that's great, because obviously you are the ultimate shroud skeptic. So I, I think that's <laughs> oh, yeah. that it, it can remove, uh, that's a, a stumbling block for a lot of Christians. They think that I think there's it is. a contradiction, yeah. and there's not. So, all right, cool. So so with that said, uh, let's get into today's topics. And we have four topics corresponding to my shroud solo shows, parts one, and uh, part of part two. Um so those topics are going to be number one. The main one was the irrelevancy of the dating. I, um, I'm hoping I can get at least one of these guys on my side today. We'll see. Um, the second is going to be obviously the carbon dating. Uh, that's uh, part of part one, a major part there. And then in parts two, we're going to be covering the Hungarian Prey Codex as proof that the shroud is not medieval, as, as I laid out the case, and um, the art history and numismatic coins argument that, again, the shroud is much earlier than the medieval period. It dates at the latest to the sixth, mid-sixth century or earlier type thing. So that's what we're going to be covering today. And the first one is obviously the irrelevancy of the dating. So I'm just going to make my opening case, um, and I'm going to alternate. So on, on this one, I'm going to give Hugh the last word, and then the next topic, Bob will get the next word, the last word, and, you know, like that. So let me share my screen here just to make my presentation for the irrelevancy of the dating. Uh, okay, cool. So the way, oh, uh, and let me turn that. Off. You get, is that showing up? Yes. All right. Just turn it to a slide show. Okay. So basically, the way I see it, the shroud skeptic has to make two uh, a twofold positive claim on their part. Number one, they have to prove that the shroud is in fact medieval, um, you know, and secondly, okay, given that it is medieval, well, that proves that it can't be a miraculous sign from God that Christianity is true. Um, and so on this front, it's the shroud skeptic that I see who has the burden of proof for both of these aspects. And essentially, you could put their argument in a simple affirming the antecedent, which is a valid deductive argument. Right. So premise one, if the shroud is provably medieval, then the shroud images are not miraculous signs that from God that Christianity is true. Well, premise two, as he would say, well, the shroud is provably medieval. Therefore, the shroud can't be miraculous proof. And obviously, in, in many of the debates, including stuff we're going to be talking about in this show, the key move is to attack premise two and say, 
you know, he will want, Shroud skeptics will want to say the Shroud is provably medieval. We've got all this stuff, carbon-14, the, the Pope's uh, bull and stuff like that. Or pro-Shroud guys will say, no, th those proofs are no good. And we've got our own proofs that, that we can prove it's not medieval. But the where I'm unique is I think we can actually question premise one as well and say, look, even if it is medieval, that alone doesn't prove that the Shroud images can't be Miraculous. No, it, the scientific evidence from Sturp is still the same. If you think that's sufficient to say the images were formed miraculously, that stays the same regardless of whether it dates to 1355 or to the time of Jesus. It can still be proof. Um, so, yeah, that's kind of. Um, now, obviously, I said the Shroud skeptic has the burden of proof here. And I've recorded about six attempts by Shroud skeptics to try and warrant the truth of premise one, that conditional. Um, so we'll find out from Hugh if I'm on the right track. But the first one is, you know, they'll, they'll just, sorry. Uh, yes, I, if, if I look as if I'm not paying attention, it's because I'm jotting them down in case, uh, in case they leave the screen for any moment. Yeah, carry on. Mm. Okay, cool. So, so the first thing I've heard is, look, the, the Shroud, uh, that would be implausible for God to do a medieval miracle. It's kind of a general objection. No, it's got to be associated to the time of Jesus. And for me, I just say, well, that's that's ridiculous. That God is able to do a miracle at any time in history uh, for various reasons. And I point to modern miracle claim he healings as a case in point. What, regardless of whether you agree or not with that, it establishes the plausibility of, a, of at least God doing miracles at other times in history. Um, then the second one is that it's ad hoc. It's, um, again, look, I'm not making a historical hypothesis or a positive claim that God did do this. I'm just saying, um, look, if we have proof that it's miraculous and we have proof that it's medieval in origin, that isn't contradictory type thing. So I'm not making a positive historical claim that it, God did do a miracle in the medieval period. In fact, I believe the opposite. Um, then there's this issue of the lack of sufficient attachment, right? So the, this is kind of what Bob was saying in his opening about how do these kids, they, they recognize Jesus from the shroud, right? We, we know that that's meant to be Jesus. It's sufficiently attached to the Jesus of the Gospels. And even, I suspect, even he will agree with that. Even if you think it's an artistic fake, it's a fake of who? Meant to portray Jesus of the Gospels. So I think in that way, we can establish it is attached to Jesus of Christianity. Uh, and that's sufficient. You don't need a chronological connection. If, if we've got, it can clearly be identified as Jesus of the Gospels, and it's we've got scientific proof that says it's a miracle, that's enough. That's all you need. <laughs> um, so then the next one, objection, or trying to warrant premise one for skeptics is the contextual indicators. Well, look, it's a burial shroud. Um, wouldn't that suggest that it would go back to Jesus and wouldn't be a medieval, uh, just a medieval creation or something like that? That makes God tricky or a deceiver. Um, as well, the, the images have certain historical and or anatomical inaccuracies. If God did a medieval miracle, why on earth would he do that? That would make him a trickster and stuff like that. And that's where I would just respond, well, it's not true. These inaccuracies aren't true. Um, and furthermore, in terms of it being a burial cloth, there are reasons, perhaps, why God would uh, do that. Maybe that was the only way to preserve it. If he did it as a, a miraculous painting on a painting canvas, it wouldn't have been preserved to 1978, where we could get the proof of its miraculous nature. And I also have a humorous that response here, based on Hugh Ferry's critique. Um, I was looking shocked. Sorry? Yeah. I was looking shocked. <laughs> Oh, tablecloth. Well, that some I remember you saying something like that. You, you said altar it, cloth. Yes, yes. Okay, okay. Um, so you, table. So, so yeah, that that's kind of the response to to this uh, type of warrant. The other one is uh, Christians might say cessationism is true. So after the New Testament was formed, um, you know, a medieval miracle would be ruled out because God stopped performing miracles. Obviously, that's a theological debate and. I would just say I'm not a cessationist. I think that's false. And finally, we have my old favorite from the skeptics, uh, the lay skeptics, Dale's biased. He's moving the goalposts. 
Uh, and I would just say, no, I, I'm not, because I, I came up with this prior to me being a Christian, prior to me believing in the Shroud. I have proof as of 2017 that I was applying it to Islam. Um, there was a couple months where I was actually thinking Islam was true on the basis of numerical patterns in the Quran. Uh, and that's something that wasn't established until 1924, the Egyptian version of the Quran. Again, I didn't say, well, it ha these patterns have to be uh, go back to the time of Muhammad. So I, I'm consistent here, whether rightly or wrong. So, so that's my case in a nutshell. Um, yeah, I guess I'll, I'll turn it. So Hugh's getting the last word on this one. So Bob, I'll start with you. What, what's your kind of take on my notion of the irrelevancy of the dating? Am I not, sir? <laughs> so are, are you saying that the uh, carbon dating is irrelevant or any type of dating is irrelevant? Any type of dating is irre is irrelevant. If let's let's pretend we find out, yeah, it does date to the medieval period. Pretend there's no problems with the carbon dating, and we prove it's medieval, but we still have the proof that it's a miraculous image. Um, the dating's irrelevant. Okay, well that that's that's an interesting uh, take on it. Uh, I've not heard that approach before. Uh, you've put a, a lot of words here on the screen that you know I feel like looking back over this and kind of digesting it a little bit. Yeah. Um, you know, I guess people in general would, would think that uh, if the date is not to the first century, to the time of Jesus, uh, then, then uh, it's not, not relevant for e using evidence. Now, you bring up some interesting points. It doesn't necessarily prove it. It's very difficult to prove anything. Tell you the truth, you know, science is not about proof, uh, and I think people get confused about that. It's about evidence, uh, and so you have to take all the evidence, you know, the the broad view of all the evidence, and, and put forward uh, hypotheses. That that's how science is done by hypotheses that make predictions, and when those predictions are tested, uh, if the predictions are false then the hypothesis is, is false, at least as stated. But, but if the predictions are found to be true, then, then that doesn't prove it. It doesn't prove the hypothesis to be true, but, but it adds to the credibility that it's true. So gradually with enough predictions being uh, proven to be true, if that's the case, that, then the hypothesis would gradually become recognized by people in general as having a high enough credibility to it to be considered true. So it, it's science is a very gradual process. And so, uh, you know, I would have to consider the, these various things, but uh, I, I would say that uh, on, the, on the other side of the coin here, that we do have enough evidence uh, to uh, date this uh, likely to the first century uh, and that the carbon dating is actually evidence that it is the authentic burial cloth of Jesus. It doesn't disprove it. It's evidence for it, which is a total 180 degree turnaround from how carbon dating is usually interpreted. Gotcha. Interesting. Yeah, and you're absolutely right. So, so the, the next stuff that we're going to be covering, it, look, we, we challenge premise two as, as, as well. But yeah, um, for, for the sake of argument, I, I want to say, well, we can also challenge premise one. So, Hugh, what, what's your general take on that? Uh, well, first of all, uh, you, Bob, is, um, like, like myself, we both come from a scientific background. And the moment the word prove appeared on the screen, uh, I, either visibly or internally, we took a, a, a sharp intake of breath. Yeah, science, scientists do demonstrations, they do evidence, they do um, suggestions and they do probabilities, but they never, ever, ever do proofs. <laughs> so um, I never say that the Shroud is provably medieval and never have. Um, or, in, or, and I'm sure Bob will, will say the same. Um, it, it, well, he just did say the same. But I'd like to pursue the, the idea of what a miracle is. Now, I'm, I'm assuming that you're taking in, from that point of view, um, a um a supernatural event an event uh inexplicable by science but i don't think that captures either the point of a miracle or what a miracle has to be uh, a lot of 
uh, miracles are considered to be things which are perhaps um, just very unusual, but which, which occurred at an appropriate time. And they're still most miraculous healings, for example, might be the same. If someone recovers spontaneously from a cancer in a, a, a hospital in Norway, it's a spontaneous recovery. If they recover spontaneously from some sort of disease while they're visiting Lourdes on a pilgrimage, then it may well be classed as a miracle. It's because of the circumstance in which it occurred rather than the fact that something truly out beyond the realms of science has occurred. Of course, th th there are um, possible miracles, such as if you start with an empty basket and you can feed 12,000 people from it, then that, that would be a miracle that was outside the realms of science. But I think there are two different kinds of miracle. And I, I suspect that if, if one might be able to go along with the idea that the shroud is of the second kind rather than the first. And what unites the two kinds of miracle, and I think Andrew Casper in his book uh, captured this very well, was that the point of a miracle is not what actually happened, but what effect it has on the people who either witnessed it or later read about it or appreciated it. And I think from that point of view, uh, I'd be very happy to uh, go along with people who class the Shroud uh, as a miracle. Uh, I'm sure that if you looked up uh, on the internet, you'll find that a lot of people think that Michelangelo's Pieta, for example, that statue of, of the Virgin Mary holding the dead Christ in her arms, which uh, is in a church, it's in the foyer of a church, you know, maybe in St. Peter's, I don't know. Uh, that's been called a miracle on the grounds that no artist and michelangelo was a, 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 an artist of an artistic kind as it were even though he was employed by people um but no human artist could have produced that he we know what it's made of we know how he did it we've got little maquettes of it and all the rest of it but nevertheless it may show the influence of the divine just in the fact that he's created it and the effect it's had on people who went to look at it so i, I think we can I, i'd go along with you and say that the the precise date of the shroud is not necessarily relevant to the effect it's had on the people who looked at it throughout the Middle Ages and the people who go and visit it now. Does okay. that is that coherent? It is. Um, yeah, but I, I so I guess this is where kind of talking about the terminology of the terms in the premise. So I, I think I, I would I'm using the term miracle in a stronger sense, right? So I'm it doesn't necessarily have to be supernatural. I, I take like Bob kind of a, a intelligent design or a specified complexity definition for miracles. And that those can involve natural events or supernatural. It, it doesn't matter. I don't specify mm -hmm. that. Um, but as long as we can detect the intelligent design via specified complexity of God for a given purpose. In, in this case, I'm interested in um, the miracles that God uses as signs to authenticate Christianity. Um, so that's a specific subset of miracles here. Um, hmm. So if it's a, a stronger thing, I, I, you know, it, it's gotta be an extraordinary event or a, you know, very improbable given our current understanding of laws of physics and stuff like that. And it's specified for the purpose of authenticating Christianity. Um, if, if the shroud were proved medieval, do you think it would falsify that understanding rather than more the Lucy? Well, oh, no, exactly. Well, that, that's precisely my point. I don't think it would. No, I think the effect that it's had um, is, is enough, really. Funnily enough, but I was in just yesterday or the day before, I was reading something about the, the shroud copies in Spain. In Is it Sabregas? Um, there's, there's, a, there's a famous shroud copy there. And there's a legend that... Uh, whether that particular cop, the person who, who painted it, or two of his friends went along and they tried to copy the shroud and they, they couldn't, they gave it up and they went home uh, <clears throat> and spent the night. And the next day they went back to collect their material and the shroud had copied itself onto their cloths. And the shroud of uh, Xabragas and some of the other Spanish copies are just uh, are the results of that. So the other shrouds are considered medieval in in the exact sense that you would like it to be considered as a um as a as a work of uh, uh, out beyond the um beyond the workings of scientific knowledge 
Gotcha. Yeah. So yeah. So if if that were true, we could establish that the the shroud somehow co miraculously copied itself in the medieval period. You're absolutely right. That would qualify. Um, hmm. Okay. So so yeah, Bob. Um, I, I get that you are you guys are both meticulous scientists, and by provably, I just mean in the legal civil law sense of uh, beyond on a balance of probabilities. That's all I'm saying. Um, yeah. do, do you kind of understand what? this uh, premise is aiming at there and would you agree with it in principle uh, i would agree with it in in principle uh i let me make one comment about uh, miracles um i try not to use the word uh, be, because uh, i try not to use the word miracle miraculous or supernatural be, because there are so many different understandings and people think that when they use the word that they're communicating to another person, but that may not be the case because there are so many different meanings of it. For example, you know, a, a, a miracle that, that we would recognize in the Bible, uh, you, you might say that a miracle is just outside of physics, but uh, who knows what the larger physics of reality is? You know, the, the science is continually progressing in better understanding uh, of reality. Uh, and so who knows where we're going to be ending up? Maybe we'll end up recognizing that there aren't just four dimensions, three space and one time, but there are anywhere from 10 to 26 dimensions. Uh, and that uh, the larger physics would have to involve all of those 10 to 26 dimensions, whereas our current science can only deal with four dimensions. So we, we're interacting, uh, in regards to science to just a very small part of the totality of reality. So I, I hesitate to even use the, the phrase miracle, but my alternative is so cumbersome that it makes it difficult as you know, the alternative would be, this is an, an event that is uh, outside or beyond our current understanding of the laws of physics. So that's the phrase that I use. Gotcha, okay, well, I'm thrilled um, because finally uh, you guys are the first two um, people to kind of uh, agree with this. Like, I, I think um, uh, it's good that I kind of explained it in this premise format because it's, it's simpler when you see it visually. Um, I know uh, some others like Guy Powell and, and stuff were a little hesitant, but yeah, you, you guys seem to be yeah. on board that uh, look, premise one, we can't, it's not true. So uh, let's just kind of get on with okay, well, the next thing to do is premise two. We, because not only has, has the shroud skeptic that does make this claim, Hugh Ferry doesn't. So I would reject this argument. Um, you know, people like Alan would make this argument when I debated him, for example, right? So look, Hugh Ferry and Bob Brecker both agree with me. Premise one is unsound or it's not, it's a deductively weak premise type we, deal. But- we, uh, but guess what? As both Hugh and Bob have uh, mentioned, premise two um, is we can evaluate that. Hugh would say it's deductively strong, and I and Bob would argue and say, no, this is this is also a deductively weak premise. So the first thing that the um, Shroud skeptic does is the carbon dating, and this was the first evidence that speaks to the truth of premise two. Um, was that 1988 carbon-14 dating. And as um, Hugh Ferry and Bob Brecker both know, in Shroud Wars round one, I kind of raised, uh, there's two aspects to the carbon dating that I see. So the first one is you can say that the Shroud skeptic is epistemically unjustified or unwarranted in believing that premise two is true, uh, that it's provably on a balance of probabilities medieval. Um, and then the second aspect of the response is, okay, but they still got this result. You know, the carbon-14 results still say the shroud is 1260 to 13, whatever it is, um, AD, 1355 AD. Uh, so how do you explain that erroneous result? So those are the two aspects. And focusing on the first aspect here, you know, is the shroud skeptic justified on the basis of the 1988 dating to believe that the shroud is probably medieval? And I answer no. And I give uh, four, four kind of 
reasons for that, right? So the first is that um, I provide undercutting defeaters in general, the general reliability of the AMS carbon 14 method at the time it dated the shroud. And this is where I gave kind of quotes from various carbon 14 scientists, you know, people like Lloyd Curry or Garmin Harbottle. Um, there was a study of the British, uh, by the British Science and Engineering Council, I think it was. Uh, again, I'll look at my notes and get the actual quotes when we get into it. But, you know, they're saying, look, there was huge problems um, with the dating and the tests. There was the Trondheim report. So this kind of, I think, would cause someone to have a lower just epistemic justification in believing the carbon-14 results. The second, getting more specific to the actual carbon dating is, look, they only dated one sample. That's, and I have a quote by Harry Gov himself that I'll get into that says, um, that's an insufficient basis. Um, and then there's also evidence that the sample was non-representative to the rest of the cloth. Now, neither Bob or I, uh, Joe, I wanted Joe Marino to be involved because this is where he would come in. Um, he goes for the invisible reweave hypothesis. I don't, I, I do think, I'm not convinced that that's the true explanation, but there is nonetheless some evidence suggesting that the shroud sample location taken is non-representative. You can't just ignore that. Um, you have to provide a defeater defeater for that. And I think uh, at least to a minor degree, it could lower someone's confidence that the shroud's medieval. And then finally, here's where Bob Rucker comes in, the, the statistical problems of all 16 raw dates taken shows that there's a 98.6%, I believe, probability that some kind of systematic bias is at play. Because of that, you don't, you don't have to specify what is that, who knows, but that would say, take away your warrant for believing the shroud is provably medieval on this basis. Um, so yeah, here, before I get into, do, do you guys want me to kind of give my specific quotes first, uh, or do you want me to turn it to you guys for your take in general? What, what do you guys prefer? I'm, I'm happy to go into it, I think, straight away. I'll just read that. Could I make a couple comments on your previous slide? Yep. Uh, yes, my main comment here would be uh, the relationship between number three and number four. Uh, number three was sample was non-represented to the rest of the cloth. Number four is statistical problems and systematic bias. Maybe a better term would be systematic error, a measurement error. Uh, and so number three and number four are actually two sides of the same coin. Uh, and, and that's an in interesting thing that should be recognized that uh, number three, it's non-representative of the rest of the cloth because of the systematic measurement error. You see how three and four are related yeah, to, yeah. to one another. Yeah, exactly. And so you could collapse three and four into one by saying that it, it's been proven in uh, four different uh, peer reviewed journals to be non-representative of the rest of the cloth, very valuable. Uh, but then my, my preference is to phrase that in sense uh, of why is it non-representative? And that's because there's a systematic error in the measurements. Gotcha. Yep, I, I fully agree with what you just said. You, you're absolutely right. Yeah, the, the fact that there is this systematic error, that part of the shroud was non-representative because other parts of the shroud would date to 8500 AD and, and they would have been irradiated differently. So yeah, yes, and, and on number two, uh, one sample location, well, you know, in, in general, you might say that, but in, in, in reality, the, sa the samples sent to the three different laboratories were right next to each other, so they weren't exactly the same location. They were, you know, a centimeter and a half apart or so, but just enough difference in location uh, in order to detect the, the uh, axial distribution of the carbon date. And the carbon date shouldn't have an axial distribution because it's one cloth. It should all be the same within the uncertainties. And it wasn't. Gotcha. All right, cool. Yeah, if you did, you want to give a response in general to that before you? I'll, I'll, all, all sorts of things. But I mean, uh, yeah, particularly, I'll agree with, with Bob's last point. Um, yes, I'll go through all of your things. First of all, the general unreliability, unreliability 
of the AMS method. It's not generally unreliable. I think it's it's absurd to pretend that it is. Now, there are certain websites, and I can see that you put up uh, a couple, of, whether you got them from Mark Antonacci's book or from actual websites, quoting, uh, there are two famous favorite things. I've just done a blog post on the famous freshly killed seal, which was found to be, was it 1,300 years old? And then also the living snails, which were found to be thousands of years old. And I would like to challenge people to suggest why do you think somebody tried to find out by radiocarbon dating the age of a snail that they just killed was it because they had no idea whether the radiocarbon dating worked or not and of course the fact is that the the marine reservoir effect the aquatic reservoir uh, effect and the fact that um, plutonic carbon, in other words, carbon from, from the earth rather than from the atmosphere, plays an important part in the makeup of lots of different plants and animals, was, was well known in 1966. And it was uh, being reasonably quantified in 1977. So these things were not uh, examples of radiocarbon dating being found completely irregular. What can we do? They were specific investigations to try and make carbon dating particularly regular. Uh, and then you briefly mentioned, I think, the Burley trial in which um, I'm making a guess here, but some 20 or so laboratories uh, were given several different samples more than lease was it Burvin, but Burley, Leith, and possibly one of the others, um, to try and find out which um, which labs were more reliable or not. And there were uh, five, three, five criteria, three criteria, three criteria, which all the labs had to uh, either pass or fail. And the three AMS labs that took part uh, passed. Nearly all of them. Now, I think they had a 90% or 80, 85% success rate, whereas the, the other labs, the scintillation labs and the um, gas counter ones, were, uh, they had a much bigger failure rate. So the, the AMS labs were, uh, even at that time, I think in 1986, demonstrated to be more reliable than any of the others. And I, I think it, there's a big canard being put about that uh, AMS dating, because it used such a tiny sample, um, was was more inaccurate. Certainly, there are more opportunities. Obviously, the smaller your sample, the more opportunity there is for um, uh, things to go wrong during the process of dating it. But the uh, comparison tests demonstrated that those had been satisfactorily coped with. So I, I think it's wrong to say that radiocarbon dating uh, either is now or was then generally inaccurate. Uh, yeah, Bob. Bob. Uh, yes, uh, you know, I, I generally agree with uh, Hugh on, on this point. Uh, uh, that, uh, but but it, it does mean that carbon dating is not a simple process. It's not just that you do the measurement and, yeah. and you get the result and you say, that's it. No, there's all these other considerations that have to go into it. You know, what was uh, material at a different carbon 14 to carbon 12 ratio added or subtracted from the sample that you're dating? Uh, and, and is the sample that you have of, of the entire item representative of the entire item? Well, you know, these are can be very difficult issues. But in general, I, I agree that when, when you're talking about the measurement of the carbon-14 to carbon-12 ratio, which is the basis for carbon dating, when you're talking about that measurement, I believe that the, the measurements are essentially accurate. Uh, and that's proven in the carbon dating of the shroud because they not only dated the shroud, but they dated uh, three what are called standards along with it. The three pieces of cloth from known historical items so that you have the historical date, you, you measure the carbon 14 to carbon 12 ratio on those, you get pretty good results on them. And that shows that uh, on the measurement of the shroud, when you measure the carbon 14 to carbon 12 ratio, you need to take that as being accurate. And so in my work, I assume that they accurately measured the carbon 14 to carbon 12 ratio 
which gave you a 1260, an average value of 1260, uh, plus or minus 31 average or mean value. But then you have to realize that the carbon dating does not just give you one value. It gives you 16 values because they had uh, one sample going to each of the three laboratories. Those laboratories cut them into subsamples, which they then dated each of the subsamples. So you have 16 uh, different values to base your hypothesis on, your conclusion on. You, not just the, the, the average value, because what we have here is that in the 16 values, there's an, uh, an axial distribution up the shroud from the bottom of the cloth. There shouldn't be. Uh, and, and there's the problem uh, of the uh, limited range of, of the values, the, the range of the values that you do have, as well as the uh, date uh, for the sudarium of Oviedo. So it's not just one value that you have from carbon dating, it's actually four. And your, your conclusion as to what it means has to be consistent with not just one value, but all four, the date, the slope, the range, and the sudarium's value. Okay, awesome. So, okay, so so I get that, um, yeah, you guys uh, aren't, aren't so much questioning the general reliability or unreliability, and, and neither would I, um, but I, I'm kind of looking for it, uh, trying to, okay, for the person evaluating carbon fourteen dating, um, they have reasons in terms of their epistemic justification or warrant in believing the premises. And well, let, let me just throw it open to you guys then. Obviously, there have been these studies that have been done, and this would cast doubt for a normal person. So let, maybe let me just throw it open to you guys. For, forget about seals and young earth crate. You know, I'm not Cantovine here. But um, look, there, there was this study. They studied 38 carbon-14 labs, and you know they found these uh, things. The margin of error for the carbon-14 dating seems to be as much as two to three times as great as practitioners have claimed. And this is in 1989, they're reporting on this study that was found. Um, and Murdoch Baxter, a famous uh, expert in this field, he says it is now clear that other un unaccounted for sources of error occur during the processing and analyzing of the samples. And he, he specifies the AMS labs in particular were way out, even on dating samples as little as 200 years old. So we, look, we, we have these results, unless you're denying that. So how, how do we explain some of these these studies? Like, why is it things went wrong then if it's re perfectly reliable? Yes, he was wrong. Um, he, uh, he was quite definitely, that wasn't true. The findings of the uh, research there definitely shows that the AMS labs, I'm just looking it up on my own thing, if I can find it, uh, were more um, accurate than any of the others. And I suspect he thinks they were inaccurate because um, they were. There was one particular error that the AMS labs were more susceptible to, um, which, as I say, was because of the tiny sample. They were more likely to have inherent uh, errors inside the laboratory. But in fact, most of the AMS labs, uh, I think they, they only tested three, but they um, they passed that test. And if I can find it, I'll mention it. Um, no, I was going to say something else. About, yeah, that is. About, I'm sorry. Are you talking about the shroud now, or something else? I'm talking about the Burley comparison test of 1986, um, in which these different labs. This is this one here. The the the, the one that's on the screen at the moment. In, and I, I have the link to the paper, oh. so that'll be on my blog for people to read. But yeah, obviously, Hugh's saying it was inaccurate. So, what's in that article is it true and okay um, yeah well no the, the, that particular comment on the paper is not true the paper the gut comment is not taken from the paper it's a comment on the paper by somebody who disagreed with it but i disagree with him okay. as you can imagine fair enough um, yes, there's one other thing sorry yeah, on, on carbon dating yes there's always the the possibility uh, as I stated before, that um, material either was added or subtracted from the sample that you have that could be at different carbon-14 to carbon-12 ratios, and that would offset uh, the measurement. You also could have uh, measurement errors in itself based upon 
the, the equipment that's being used? You know, what, what is the variation in the voltage going to the equipment that's doing the measurement? Things like that. But, but the, the, and, and so that uh, the, the effectiveness, the precision of carbon dating uh, undoubtedly has made progress uh, over the years. And so some of this, these questions might have arisen from uh, you know, older techniques uh, be before some of the equipment was as precise as it is today, uh, and that it may be due to uh, different materials at different carbon-14 to carbon-12 ratios either being added or subtracted. But, but the, real, the real analysis here has to be related to the carbon dating of the shroud. And, and so it, it comes down to whether the three standards, these three other pieces of cloth that were dated, were they accurately dated? Uh, and material two was uh, linen from the tomb of uh, a tomb in Egypt, I won't try to pronounce it. Material three was a mummy of Cleopatra from, from Egypt. Uh, material four was the uh, cope of St. Louis the Anjou of France. Uh, and so the significance level here of material two, now material one was the shroud, but material two was 93.4% significance. And that high significance level means that there's, there, uh, that the value that was obtained uh, on that is, is highly reliable. Uh, material three was 52.1 significant uh, and material four was 30.3. Now that indicates that material four they had less credibility to it. Now, and this is based upon analysis of the uncertainties of the measurements themselves. But when, when we quote those three values, the 93.4, 52.1, and 30.3 for the standards, uh, we, we should note here that, that the significance level that was quoted in Damon, uh, which, which is uh, th this paper in, in which all the carbon dating results were given, the significance level for material one, which was for the shroud, was 5%. That's much lower than 90, 50, or 30% significance. So that there was much more uncertainty in the value for the shroud relative to the other ones. Now, it's interesting here that in typical statistical analysis of measurement data, uh, when they calculate the significance level, and I realize that for the layman, this, this isn't meaningful, but typically the criteria for uh, practitioners of statistical analysis is that a 5% level is adequate to believe, okay? But uh, so in Damon, they listed a 5% level. But, but it's interesting here that when I recalculate that value, that significance level uh, from the data in Damon, I get 4.18%. So in other words, the, the real value, according to their data, is 4.18%, which they then rounded up to five. Now, why would they round up to five? 4.18 rounds to four. But if they rounded it to four, it would fail. And they would have to admit that the small sample dating technique does not give an accurate result for the Shroud of Turin. They would have to do that. Now, it gets worse because then when, when that 4.18% that was only based on assuming that their analysis of the average values from the three laboratories was accurate. Okay, let's go further. And this is all in my paper number 12 on the statistical analysis. Paper 12 is uh, paper number 12 on the, the research page. That'd be the third page over on my website, shroudresearch.net. Uh, but when I recalculate that value, Instead of just using the three values, mean values from the three different laboratories, if I go back to the 16 values and recalculate that significance level, it's 1.4%. So in other words, by their, their manipulation of the statistical analysis, they raised the significance level from 1.4 to 5%. I call that cheating. Gotcha.
All right, cool. Uh, Hugh, did, were you wanting to say something or were you finished on that one? Um, <clears throat> no, I, I, well, I'll um, follow that along. Um, firstly, yes, um, it's, it is, uh, no, uh, yes, how much I said. If you think the shroud is medieval, then the radiocarbon date supports that um, contention. So you don't really have any particular, no, no, but if you think it's medieval, yeah, but no, it comes out as it does. No. But if, well, and I'm, I'm coming to you, Bob, in a moment. Whereas yeah. if you think the shroud is authentic, then you have to demonstrate why the carbon 14 date is incorrect. Mm -hmm. Now, um, I'm a little confused here because I think there are two bits of, of um, irregularity and um, that, that Bob's putting forward. Firstly, um, do, do the, uh, the three different parts of the shroud that were tested, are they statistically coherent? And he's demonstrated, he's absolutely right, uh, that they're not. Uh, and I agree with you, uh, absolutely. And I even suspect that you may be right that the uh, 4.1 was rounded up to five just to show that they were coherent. However, there was a reason for that. And this was that they knew uh, at the time, and I say knew, I put new in inverted commas because nowadays we know something different or, or we, we guess something different. But they knew that the three bits that they tested all came from the same piece of cloth. And therefore, there was no reason that they could think of why these anomalies could possibly, uh, you can't say they came from different cloths because they quite obviously came from the same cloth. Uh, and so they, uh, well, first of all, of course, they said that the it was probably because the uh, the error bars, the individual laboratories had thought that their errors were far too sm were, were smaller than they actually were. And if you widen the error bars, then the dates overlap more or less satisfactorily. That was, that was the first thing they did. And secondly, as Bob says, they then tested it with their chi squared um, thing and they came up with, you're quite right, I've done the same calculation myself, 4.1, and rounded it up rather than down. But I think the reason they did that was simply in order to show that as far as they were concerned, these three bits of cloth came from, three, three little bits of cloth all came from the same sheet, which they'd seen cut out. So there was no reason to suppose that they'd actually come from different cloths. Um, funnily enough, almost an exactly similar kind of uh, test of almost exactly the same time was done on some clothing and I think a cushion belonging to Francis of Assisi. Uh, and they tested three different bits of cloth and one of them came out of different age from the other two. And rather than just trying to adjust the results to say that they all came from the same bit of cloth, it was obvious that the cushion uh, was different from the uh, tunic. It was actually of a different date. One did belong to St. Francis of Assisi and the other one didn't. And so that's quite fair enough. And I'm, I, I follow Bob all the way along there. Oh. However, what I then want to know is, but does that mean that the entire, should they have then rejected the radiocarbon dating completely and simply say, we don't know? The date is unknown. It could just as easily, it could just as easily be first century as as medieval. Yes. Or should they look at all their results, as indeed the subsequent statisticians have, including Tristan Casabianca, and most particularly including Walsh and Schwalbe in their last statistical analysis, and said what this shows is that there is a chronological discrepancy along the three, uh, uh, along the little sample. But that doesn't show that the shroud is not medieval, only that there is some reason for why some bits are earlier or later than others. That's the, what the um, conclusion has been of both Tristan Casabianca and the uh, Schwalbe and, and, and Lawrence. Uh, not that the date should be refuted completely. And then, of course, we also have to say that if we announce that the, the, the results were completely meaningless, and that had somebody else, if somebody does those results now, more accurately, they will probably come out as first century, then there would be absolutely no need for either Bob to come up with his neutron hypothesis or for Joe to come up with his reweaving hypothesis. 
So if you if you sincerely reject the carbon dating, then I don't understand why hypotheses to explain the carbon dating are required. Okay. Could I explain? Could, could I explain it then? Of course. So, of course. Bob, I'm gonna I'm gonna let you guys go back and forth, but I just want to clarify for the audience because you guys kind of got a bit ahead of of what we're doing. So I'm oh, sorry. Uh, no, not a problem at all. It's it's great. So. I just want to clarify for the audience. So both of your guys' position is, look, in terms of number one here, this wouldn't uh, just uh, lower, it shouldn't lower someone's justification in terms of these failed experiments. Uh, you should, that shouldn't have an impact on whether you believe premise two or not, one way or the other. Um, also, similarly for number two, so I had a quote from Harry Gov. I, I can bring that up on the screen for people um, where he was talking about, look, this, this bringing down from three samples down to one, uh, this will lead to people questioning in strictly scientific terms because of this arbitrarily small statistical basis. Both of you guys would confirm uh, that that sh really shouldn't lower your confidence in the results one way or the other, just because there's this one sample kind of thing. Um, would you guys concur that that's not it shouldn't impact one's justification for premise two. No, that's okay. Yeah, and Hugh, you're yes, I, I, no, I, I, yes, I, I think I agree with that. I, but I, it does mean that, that there's no need to ex if if those results are genuinely completely meaningless, then there's no need to try and explain them. If, if you see what I mean, if they should have been rejected altogether, well, then we must assume that pretend that the carbon dating never occurred. And we're back to the position that the shroud is either uh, medieval or authentic on the basis of other evidence. But in fact, the explanation, uh, in, instead of re rejecting the carbon-14, it's being explained, which suggests, I mean, and you said yourself, Bob, that the uh, you think that the stuff that was dated produced reliable ratios of carbon-14 to 13. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So if the shroud, that's that's what a medieval... Uh, but uh, someone like me who thinks the shroud is medieval would also agree that they produced accurate reasons, but accurate dates, and that the, the dates are oh, not not accurate dates, I should say, accurate ratios, and that those ratios reflect a minor contamination along the sample, uh, not um, uh, different amounts of reweaving or different amounts of radiation. All right, cool. Okay, so cool. The, that's cool. our point. Yeah, but I think on the on the measurement, we agree. Yeah. Okay, cool. So, uh, and then the last part, the non outside of its association with the argument that you and Bob are going over right now, uh, you know, other stuff like that, Joe, people for the invisible reweave, uh, I'll just, you know, Joe is not here to represent his side. So I'll just put it to you guys, just for your opinion. Do you guys think none of these factors kind of would make someone lower their epistemic justification in the truth of premise two? It, it's all related to number four. Do you guys both agree on that? Are, are we talking about uh, cotton? Yeah, all, all of these. Yeah, all, all these, those. Uh, should this lower someone's confidence in the carbon-14 results or no? In your guys yes, uh, it should certainly lower someone's confidence, but that's not the same as rejecting it. <laughs> okay. If you see what I mean, I mean again, we're onto this business of 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 scientists and uh, don't prove things. We, at the end of the day, it's not a the jury doesn't go out and come back and say guilty or not guilty in a scientific discussion. You've yeah, got yeah. you, you uh, just yeah, get the, your, your confidence uh, slightly weakened. Yeah, I don't think any of these have any effect on on carbon dating. Okay, okay, cool. So so Hugh Ferry is saying with these things, it should lower your confidence to some degree. Bob is saying. No, it should have no impact whatsoever. Be, be, because of the extreme uh, procedures that they use for cleaning the, the material. Awesome. Mm -hmm. All right, cool. So, been, no, just out no. of interest, I noticed that once again, and I wish it would gone to bed by now, you've got the blue quad mosaic picture. Well, I, I know that the, yeah. So I think it's I, a I've massive red herring. Have you got a copy of it? I there, that put on the screen. Um, not a... Uh, I, I know the article where I have it, but I didn't take a picture of it. Um, yeah. because well, I, the, I know the Yeah, go ahead. But the point about the blue quad mosaic, uh, as it's presented by authenticists in general, is that the colors of the image represent the uh, chemicals 
different chemicals of the shroud. Um, is that right? And they look at the bottom left hand corner and they say that it's particularly green there. And that means that that bottom corner is a different chemical from the rest of the shroud. Would you agree with that? That's that's what people normally say. But yeah, yeah, but yeah. But what they never look at is that you see this little green patch in the bottom left hand corner. And they never see that the fact that about the top third of each of these images is bright blue. And when you say, well, following your premise, this means that the top third, I mean, in huge, great bands across the shroud, being, according to the quad mosaic, bright blue, must indicate that the shroud is made of a completely different substances in stripes all the way along the cloth, which I, 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 I submit is absurd. And therefore, simply looking at the color of the blue quad mosaic is not a reliable um, or sensible way of discrediting the radiocarbon dating. Gotcha. So, so yeah. So, so since you put that to me, so obviously, again, I'm, I'm evaluating my shroud solo show that I did back in 2018, and there have been some updates. I've had Bob and yourself come on and address specifically the blue quad mosaic thing. So, I, I will admit, I've been persuaded by your guys' counters on that front. I don't think we can use the fact the corner where the shroud sample was taken from it shows up blue, uh, not green necessarily, um, in that. Display. I, I don't think that proves one way or the other kind of thing. But nonetheless, it's evidence I presented on the show in 2018. So I just wanted to throw it out. There. Um, so, so yeah, so that's an update. Um, all right, cool. So now I'm going to throw it open to you guys to discuss what you really want to about this, these statistical arguments. And I kind of interrupted. I know, Bob, you wanted to respond to Hugh's take there. So I'll give you guys... Um, do you guys think 20 minutes uh, you guys can discuss it or yeah no, no, i've got a feeling we sort of agreed with each other in the end um well, well I, which is that the um these samples were measured at the with the proportions that they had and we agree that those were the proportions of the radio uh, of radiocarbon in the 12 or 16 different samples yep. and um we agree that they show different dates and that therefore the uh say the two ends of the little strip that was cut from the shroud are not um to be considered to be of an equivalent date but what we're not doing is saying that because of that simple system, therefore, the carbon dating should be rejected completely and it has no relevance and we might just as well assume it hadn't happened at all. Because if we decided that the carbon dating was of such little significance that we can assume it hadn't happened, then there'd be absolutely no necessity to try and demonstrate that the shroud had been irradiated with neutrons. Okay. Or to even, you know, to come up with a plan. Don't you think, Bob? Uh, no, no, uh, you're mi you're missing an important point. Oh, good. <laughs> yeah, I tried to ex tried to explain this before, and other people have uh, raised this issue. Uh, but but let's see. Let me let me try and start off. Uh, you know, we had the little strip cut from the shroud. Uh, there mm -hmm. were samples that were then sent, cut right next to each other, sent to the three different laboratories. Uh, they came up with uh, different dates. There's a slope to the date that is outside the range of the uncertainties. So that there is not only a, a date that was obtained, but there's also a slope that was obtained. Uh, when, when you consider the 16 samples, we also have the range of the values that need to be considered. So it's not just one value, the 1260 plus oh, no, no. We're, we're going all the way along. It's not just the one value. So that, so that now, if you assume, when, now, the conclusion of the paper was that the shroud dates uh, to 1260 to 1390 with a 95% uh, probability. The reviewer uh, of this paper uh, for Nature said that that statement should be rejected, should be deleted, but they chose not to. Okay, and so, so if the reviewer to the paper uh, believes that something should be deleted and the publisher doesn't do it, you have to ask yourself why, what's going on here? Um, so what I, what I want to say is that there's actually 
carbon dating is a four-step process. Step one, you, you take samples of the entire item because you don't want to destroy the entire item in your carbon dating. So you, you take samples that are representative of the whole. You, you need that. Secondly, then, um, you take those samples and you carbon date them. That, that means that you measure the carbon-14 to carbon-12 ratio. The third step then is to take that ratio and you calculate the date, making an assumption that that ratio has only changed due to decay of the carbon-14, okay? Now that's, that's where some of these uh, uh, variety of dates come from, from the snail or wh whatever. Uh, because that assumption is not correct, that there's been a, a different material with a different carbon-14 to carbon-12 has either been subtracted or added to the sample. But then the fourth item that's done, and this, this is an essential part of carbon dating, uh, at, that you take the, the, all of the data and you do a statistical analysis on all of the data, not just the average, not just the mean, but all 16 values, do a statistical analysis. Uh, and you can do that because every measurement gives you two values. It gives you the, the value of the interest, the date in this case, and it gives you the uncertainty. Well, what good is the uncertainty, you might ask? Well, the, it's the uncertainty that tells you how to interpret what the date means, okay? So you have to do the statistical analysis on all 16 values. Uh, and when you do that, you find out that, that the significance level is far below 5% needed to believe the results. So therefore, they should have simply accepted that result and said, uh, the, our answer is uh, beyond reason. And therefore, in, in, on page six, uh, paragraph 23, popular guy is on the phone call. Okay. Paragraph uh, 23, it's, it says, and this is the key problem, the key error that was made uh, in the paper. Uh, it is unlikely that the errors quoted by the laboratories for sample one fully reflect the overall scatter. So Thank what you, they did, they just assumed away the problem. They didn't give you the correct analysis of the problem. They realized that the uncertainties were not consistent with the dates and the dates were not consistent with the uncertainties. And they simply assumed it away. And they should not have done that. That's the basic problem in this entire paper. And, and it's led to 30 years of trying to respond to that simple error in their assumption. Yeah. Okay? So, so that once, once you realize the uncertainties are not consistent with the dates and the dates are not consistent with the uncertainties. Then you have to reject the date, the 1260 plus or minus 31, which was, was the average. You have to reject that date as having been meaningful at all be, because the inconsistency between the uncertainties and the dates and the dates and the uncertainties uh, it, it is that there was a systematic measurement error in the values. So once you, re you can reject the 1260 to 1390, because that's based on the average value of 1260 plus or minus 31. But then the data is still good in the sense that you can then take the dates and calculate back to the values of the carbon 14 to carbon 12 that was measured. So that those values then still show the inconsistency uh, between those measurements and the uncertainties. So whether you use the dates to do it or whether you use the, un the ratios to show the inconsistency, you still end up with the result that the value, that the date, uh, either the, the average date of 1260 plus or minus 31 or the range of 1260 uh, to 1390, that should be rejected. But you still know that the measurements, the 16 measurements, of the carbon 14 to carbon 12 were accurately done, basically. Perfect. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Within the uncertainty. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, yeah. It's, okay. it's, it's, so, so yeah. that it's on that basis that you then have to explain why these un, why the uncertainties were not consistent with the dates and the dates with the uncertainties. You have to explain that, and that's what I do.
Brilliant. So, and just to check, so you would speculate that if that little piece of the Arizona sample that still exists that Barry photographed the other day, if that was tested tomorrow, it's likely to come up with the medieval ratio. Oh, of, yes. Sorry, yes. Yeah. Yeah, certainly. Oh, that's, that's fine. Yeah. Uh, it, it would simply confirm uh, the, the slope that we already know to be true from the three values from the from the three in that, in that case, I, I, I agree with you perfectly. That's exactly right. Yeah. 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 So that the slope uh, between the three different samples is about 36 years per centimeter, which is about 91 years per inch. So what that's saying, if you if at that rate, uh, if you move the sample point up 10 inches, then you would get a date that's 910 years. Uh, shifted forward in other words oh, oh yeah and and and, and i've future. heard yes it, it exactly so, to the yeah. future so my calculations my nuclear analysis computer calculations that i've done uh, indicate that that uh, based upon this explanation we would expect about 70 percent of the shroud to date to the future from today mm -hmm. so you know something seriously wrong with the measurements yeah uh, well i agree with that but I'd also say that one way of explaining the difference in the uh, the different radio uh, radiocarbon ratios might be neutron radiation, or it might be uh, a very small area of contamination uh, with, say, a uh, hydrocarbon of using um, terrestrial with, with terrestrial carbon in it, which has made the date of the oldest sample older than it really than it than it ought to be. Yes, but this didn't show up in comparison to the to the standards that were run, uh, and you can see that in, in you know the significance level of ninety percent, fifty, and thirty percent is far above the one point four that they obtained. There was something else going on. Hmm. Well, as I say, uh, the um, the last paper, statistical analysis, the the, the Lawrence and Schwell paper. Did you read that? Yes. They decided that it could be that there was. Uh, the Oxford uh, cleaning process had resulted in uh, some residual contamination, either uh, that was making the Oxford sample too young, too old, or the other two samples too young. Uh, yes, now, from a scientific standpoint, that should be considered as an option uh, that would then produce a hypothesis yep. that would lead to testing. Now, yes. that's what I'm doing. I'm using the values and I'm, I'm making the assumption that the cleaning process was so extreme. And, and it was, uh, you, you, you're boiling these samples in hydrochloric and, and sulfuric acid, you're boiling them so that where you end up with less than 50% of the material remaining, that would clean it. Yes, hmm. and, and, hmm. and so my hypothesis here is that the measurements, the measured values of carbon 14 to carbon 12 were accurate. And that, that is what then motivates me to come up with, with this uh, vertically collimated radiation burst hypothesis, which, which adequately explains and is consistent with image formation, carbon dating, and the blood, the dried blood now being on the shroud. Yeah, yeah, I, I follow that. It's just that uh, I, I think that the contamination hypothesis uh, presented by the uh, Schwab and Lawrence paper is also valid. And that's the hypothesis that I would work on. Okay, yes, no, see, no, no I'm not sta stating that my hypothesis is true. What I'm saying is that my hypothesis Explained. is a very good hypothesis because it's consistent with the data, it makes predictions that can be tested, uh, and it, it explains multiple, I mean, the only one that has done this, it explains multiple mysteries of the shroud. Now, it, if you can, if someone else can, th can then take an hypothesis that, that there was samples uh, th with some contamination that altered the carbon dating, that hypothesis should be followed up and see if you can then develop an hypothesis that explains three mysteries of the shroud using that hypothesis. Mm. Now, I, I challenge you to do that. I don't think you'd be able to. Yeah. Um, well, well, we'll 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 come to the, the vertically collimated. One in a minute, because because the the uh, effect on the ratio of the radiocarbon sample is done with neutrons, which, as I understand it, are not vertically collimated. Is that not right? 
Um, well, I, I ran these calculations in, in uh, 2013 over probably a six month period using uh, my typical nuclear analysis computer code that I'd, I'd been using for about 12 years uh, in the nuclear industry. Uh, and I, I ran probably four or 500 cases uh, in, in order to bracket all of the uncertainties, including the direction of the neutrons. So I ran cases with, with them vertically up, vertically down, uh, going in all, all which way directions. So I've run everything. But uh, in, in the development of uh, my hypothesis to explain the image, I, I've, I've come to the realization that these, it had to be by charged particles that were vertically collimated in order to communicate the information to control the discoloration mechanism. Oh, yeah, 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 so I follow that. Yeah, but, so, so that the, the protons had to be vertically collimated so that uh, if it was deuterium nuclei that was splitting, then the neutrons would be also be vertically collimated in the opposite direction. So I've, just in thinking through on this process, I now believe that, that the neutrons also had to be vertically collimated. But, but this, this process, this radiation burst was oscillating between vertically up and vertically down so that the neutrons were also oscillating between vertically up and vertically down. That's where I am. And so when how, we, yes. and how, did, how did they affect the sudarium of Oviedo, which was some 15 centimeters, 20 centimeters away out to the side of the body? They, they, these neutrons then, uh, as they vertically were projected from the body, they went through the air gap between the body and the cloth. They went through the cloth, through the resulting air into the limestone where they would bounce around uh, because they're not charged. So they don't interact with the electrons, yeah. they only interact with the nucleus. They bounce around on the average about 150 times before being absorbed somewhere. And in that process, they, they lose energy, generally coming down into the thermal range. I'm, I'm sorry if this is getting technical. No, but no, 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 I'm process, standing up. But in, in the process, they flood the tomb with neutrons with a certain distribution that is calculated by my computer code. So that, uh, so that uh, I was originally uh, doing these calculations with the idea that we had three data points, that we had the date, we had the slope and the range of the values on the Shroud of Turin. And after I finished the calculations, what well, I thought I was done, it then occurred to me, no, we have a fourth point. We have the dating for the sudarium. Well, where's the most likely place for the sudarium to be located? Well, it occurred to me the most likely place, the person who was doing the burial, uh, the body would be brought and put on the, the bottom half of the cloth. The person doing the burial, I, I like to think it was the apostle John, uh, then took off the face cloth. And what would he have done with it? Well, most people are right-handed. He just drop it even with his body. So I thought, okay, let's look in my calculations, even with the body on the right bench. And when I looked there, it gave me a date of 700 AD. And what was the laboratory's dates on the sudarium? About 700 AD. So it's a confirmation that my calculations were right. Hmm. And this hypothesis I uh, is right. Yeah, that sounds excellent. I hadn't read your latest uh, uh, version in which the neutron radiation was also collimated as it left the body. I think that was a, yes. that's fairly new, isn't it? That's recent. Yes, it, it really doesn't make too much difference because once the neutrons get, get into the limestone that bounce around enough that the overall um, distribution of the neutrons really depends more on the shape of the body and the shape of the limestone in the tomb. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, I'll follow that. No, no, that's very interesting. That's, that's, uh, that's new to me. So thank you. Yes, okay. Awesome. Okay, cool. So, so just for the audience to, to understand uh, where we kind of stand. So uh, let me just share the screen again. In terms of those, uh, oops, got too far ahead. Um, so in terms of the these uh, things that I covered in my Trout Solo Show Part One, uh, we're all agreed that the first three, uh, well, actually, no, we're not. So the first two shouldn't affect anyone's believing in the car 1988 carbon 14 dating results or not. Um, on number three, at least bracketing out the overlap between Bob Rucker's statistical thing, uh, Bob says that it shouldn't make a difference one way or the other. 
Hugh says, well, it should lower your confidence, but just a little bit. It's still more probable than not and that you should believe in the carbon-14. Now we're here on, on number four. This is really what Bob and, and um, uh, Hugh have been debating here. And I now Bob is, has been clear that, look, this aspect should destroy your confidence. You should be, at the very least, agnostic, or he's presented through his mechanism, you should believe that the shroud is not medieval on the basis of the carbon-14 results. Uh, Hugh, I want to get from you. So are, are you saying that what Bob is saying here is kind of an equal, equally probable explanation? Should we be agnostic? No, well, I, I, it's, Bob's explanation fits the data, which I think is fine. Um, and he's right. It does account for um, other ideas, not at least, uh, or, or it can do, and for possible ideas. Um, and it is testable. So in that sense, it's a thoroughly commendable hypothesis. Mm -hmm. uh, on the other hand, I don't find on the basis of other evidence regarding the shroud uh, that it's likely, and I think it's more likely to be a bit of residual contamination and would pursue that. And I suppose we will find out uh, eventually when various bits are, are studied at more detail, um, either the rice sample, uh, if any bits of it are uh, still available, would show the, 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 the gradient moving away. But I think it should be studied in terms of the contamination that's on it and whether the, um, whether the, the application of ether as part of the cleaning agent and all that sort of thing can affect the, um, the, the, the radiocarbon content of various bits of the cloth. And from Bob's point of view, you just need to grab a tiny thread from anywhere in the middle of the shroud and uh, it, it'll date far into the future. And that, that would be a good way of discriminating between our two hypotheses. Uh, yes, I think it was in 2002 when they did a re refurbishment of the shroud. Oh, yeah. uh, and they took off the backing cloth, they took off the, the patches that were over the elbows, for example, 16 patches on the cloth uh, were removed and they found a fully carbonated material uh, underneath those patches. It was a surprise. So they broke that material off and put it into, I think it was uh, 40, little, little glass tubes. Little or something. sample jars. I think it was 42 sample jars. And I hope they kept good records as to where this material came from. But uh, those right. sample jars then went into the vault uh, and they've been in the vault for the last 20 years. Uh, and so it, it, th that material should be carbon dated. Uh, and it wouldn't affect how the shroud appears at all. It's a very nope. good idea to date that material. Uh, or, and, or a piece of the Holland cloth, which wouldn't even be a piece of the shroud at all. Yeah, yeah yes. Uh, and, but that material, I would predict that 70% of that material would date to the future relative to today because it would have more carbon-14 in it than is present in our environment due to neutron absorption on the cloth. Mm -hmm. Okay, all right, cool. So so just kind of finishing this part off then with, with Hugh, because I just want to, I, I understand Bob's position, and, and my position is the same as his, that this, this represents, what Bob is saying here, represents an undercutting defeater. It, it undercuts someone's justification for saying the shroud is medieval or probably medieval, 51% or more, on the basis of the 1988 carbon-14 dating alone, the empirical data. Now, you, you said you agreed with that apart oh, yeah, from yeah. Other... I mean, uh, there are lots of uh, hypotheses. Um, you will perhaps know that I posted, I think, on the Shroud Science Group thing a little while ago. I think I'm allowed to say what I posted, even if it's a confidential thing that uh, someone has demonstrated that uh, the caves in particular are good portals for aliens to come in and out and the shroud of Turin is evidence of that now, i don't know i don't know what uh, experimental uh, data they they would put forward to test that hypothesis uh, but you know it's a hypothesis oh, okay. um, so I'm not sure. I'm not sure as scientists, Bob and I would actually grace it with the title hypothesis, which sounds more scientific than it is. Uh, but there are there are hypotheses. I think Bob's is more undermining of the carbon dating uh, accuracy than the idea that caves are portals for aliens. Oh, okay, cool. So, so 
the, that means that the only reason you're maintaining that on the basis of the 1988 carbon-14 dating is on the basis of outside evidence, outside of, so by that, what did you mean by that? Is it something that's related to the empirical dating of the shrouds? Yes. Or is it like you're talking well, no, about? No, no, uh, the, um, the shroud was uh, quite likely to be medieval um, uh, long before the carbon date. And uh, the carbon date confirmed that it was medieval. I mean, to my from my point of view. Okay. Cool. What it didn't do, what it didn't do, where I would agree with Bob, is that it didn't pin down any particular date uh, because of the statistical inconsistencies. Okay. Okay. Cool. Uh, so that so that's uh, very interesting and a, and a great revelation. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much for that kind of thing because. Yeah, my, the pro shroud. I think their goal. Look, we don't have a burden of proof, and it's about providing an undercutting defeater. And obviously, there are rebutting. Is, yeah, you see that this you're 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 treating it as if it was a court of law, and the jury was going to come up and say we've decided. But the, the, an artifact, historical artifact, or or a scientific experiment is is not a court of law. Fair enough. All right. Cool. So. Uh, with that, um, the, I just want to ask you very quickly before we get into the next topic. Um, so on, on my Shroud Solo Show Part 1, um, you guys have already gotten into this, but I outlined four different proposals to explain uh, the erroneous results. And I, you guys have already kind of gotten into this, but I covered these four options. So the first is the bioplastic coding hypothesis. And I ultimately said that's been scientifically falsified. There's also the invisible reweave hypothesis, Joe Marino, Barry Schwartz, those guys. Um, and this is still very much a live, viable option. There are pro shroud people still arguing for this today. Um, they do, they are, but you, you, you do have to provide, I mean, this is the trouble, but you have to provide some evidence and simply saying that something's invisible, therefore it's present, uh, is not very good evidence for it, really. Yeah, okay, cool. Um, and and we I also mentioned John Jackson's carbon monoxide hypothesis as a form of extraordinary contamination. And then obviously we have the neutron absorption. You and Bob have been talking yeah. about that. So no well, the, the, the carbon monoxide hypothesis was sufficiently sensible um, to be tested at some length and in uh, by the Oxford Laboratory by Christopher Ramsey um, and found that they it, they couldn't force um modern carbon into cloth even under considerable pressure and in atmospheres exclusively of carbon monoxide and so uh, and the the result was non-existent they couldn't force it in at all so the idea that it might have got in during a fire of some kind uh has become increasingly remote awesome okay cool so very mm -hmm. very very quickly because i want to move on to the hungarian prey thing but i want to put it to you guys uh, am, am I right in terms of these four things? Have I missed any other hypotheses that people have uh, submitted? And of these uh, ones, which ones do you guys feel are the only viable ones that that does have merit in studying or debating or something? Uh, so I'll start with you, Hugh, since you're highlighted. Already. Yes, I, 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 from my point of view, I think Bob's is, is the only hypothesis that sensibly threatens the idea that the Shroud is medieval on radiocarbon dating alone. Uh, if you want to put another one in, uh, you could put in um, the conspiracy theories of um, Bruno Bonnet Amard or, um, uh, oh, what's his name? The Australian who lives in Perth. Anyway, him. Uh, the the, the, uh, the um, uh, Russian secret police hypothesis. Oh, I've forgotten his name. I haven't even heard of these, so these are, are probably not mainstream, but it's um, so conspiracy theories. Interesting. Well, just, well, just mention uh, to see whether Bob agrees with you. Um, oh, what's his name? Stephen Jones. Oh, okay. You know Stephen Jones? He's, he has a blog, a blog called the Shroud of Turin blog spot. Yeah, um, I've read And that. he thinks that one of the Arizona testing team, a chap called Timothy Linick, uh, was paid by the Russian secret police to falsify the radiocarbon dates. And that mm -hmm. and, uh, some German um, uh, uh, hacker, computer hacker, uh, was responsible for managing to falsify the Oxford and the Zurich ones. Um, and then Bruno Bonnet, Bonnet 
Amard, who is um, some kind of cleric uh, in a church of his own devising, thinks that the radio, the samples were switched in the secret um, part of the sacristy, which wasn't filmed during the um, during the taking of the samples in 1988. So conspiracy theories is um, is definitely E, and I don't think they have a leg to stand on. But they are others that you missed. Awesome, awesome, cool. Uh, yeah, <laughs> oh, what, what's your take on that question? Uh, um, the the four different items that we're looking at here. Yeah, did I did I miss any? And of of the ones that I list, which ones are still viable? Uh, okay, uh, on A, uh, I, I normally when I list them, I I list uh, three separate items. One is ordinary contamination uh, from handling, uh, and that and the other would be intentional contamination by placing uh, talc or wax uh, on the shroud, and then I list bio. Uh, plastic coating uh, separately. So I, I tend to break the uh, A down into three different options. Uh, B, invisible reweave hypothesis. I don't believe there's any merit to this. I'm sorry. Um, I, I, you know, I, I just reviewed the, the, the videos that uh, allegedly su support this. And I think all of the evidence that's listed there has better explanations. And I just, I just don't think there's any evidence for it. Uh, John Jackson's carbon monoxide hypothesis, I agree with you, so that there is only one option. There's a neutron absorption hypothesis. And, and this hypothesis was the first one that, that was uh, suggested, proposed uh, Phillips, right? by Phillips, Tom Phillips, who was working at the Harvard laboratory uh, at that time. Um, so I, I think that this, this was the first hypothesis that was made. Uh, it was not followed up on uh, because there was no way to do nuclear analysis, computer calculations on it. I wanted to at the time, but I was unable to because I didn't have a computer fast enough. I, I didn't have the time to do it. I was very busy. Uh, and uh, I didn't have a computer code that could actually do the calculations. And those three items finally became available to me in 2013 when I did the calculation. So I was the one who followed up on Tom Phillips' original first proposal to explain the carbon dating. Awesome. All right, cool. Well, yeah, with that said, I, I think we've kind of covered the carbon-14 dating uh, topic. So now we can move on to the next one, um, which is, OK, great. Now forget about undercutting the carbon-14. Um, Pro-shroud experts claim to have rebutting defeaters for premise two, that the shroud is probably medieval as well. And one of those that I mentioned in my Shroud Solution Part 2 was the Hungarian Prey Codex. Um, so I've just realized that I'm going to pause the recording because I accidentally closed my PDFs with pictures and everything, and it's not letting me minimize while I'm recording. So I'm just going to pause the recording for one split second and then see if I can minimize it. So hang on. All right, hello everybody. So welcome, uh, welcome back. We had a short little break. Um, so yeah, I wanna move on to the next topic in my Shroud Solo Show part two. And this will be the final topic for today just because it's getting a bit long, um, but it's gonna be on what's called the Hungarian Prey Manuscript or Codex. And this is allegedly positive uh, evidence on a balance of probability that, look, this manuscript was made based on copying features from the Shroud of Turin. And on that front, we can date the Shroud of Turin earlier than the medieval period to, you know, 1192 to 1195 is when this manuscript was made. And therefore the Shroud of Turin predates that. Um, now, why, why do people, um, I've, I've kind of lost my notes just so the audience knows. So I have to go based on memory, but on my blog page, I have all those sources and pictures and everything. So check out my blog and you'll see both, both sides of the debate in full. But just based on memory, so, so there's two panels here, right? So there's the upper panel, which is the anointing of Jesus' body um, being taken down from the cross. And this corresponds to what we see with the Shroud of Turin Man, the Shroud Man, right? So number one, you've got Jesus with um, long hair. He's got his arms crossed over, covering his groin area. He's totally nude. And uh, his thumbs are hidden, um, and these are these are features that um, are 
unique or very rare in Byzantine art, especially the nudity aspect. So, you know, that's why uh, shroud scholars say, well, they must be using the shroud as a template for, you know, portraying how Jesus looked at the time of his anointing. And then even more convincingly on the bottom, this is where we have the resurrection scene. So you have the angel sitting on a, a bench, uh, not, uh, in my opinion, not surfing on, on this, uh, the shroud here, as he would put it. But um, yeah, so, so this is the Shroud of Turin, um, according to pro Shroud guys, so Hugh's going to disagree with this, but we, we say that this is the Shroud, right? So you have the frontal um, image, and uh, I guess it's going to be, oh, well, uh, Bob, would you be able to, the most convincing feature here for me personally is the L-shaped holes or the poker holes. So Bob has a slide kind of giving you a close-up of that. Um, so yeah, so you can see these little L-shaped holes here, and this is really what convinces me, because on the Shroud of Turin, there's these poker holes. Um, back in time, people thought it was caused by a poker. Now people think, no, it's incense that caused it, but it's in the exact same shape and relative location that we see in the Hungarian Prey Codex. So this establishes some kind of link, and I think this is the most conclusive factor um, there's also on the bottom thing, the, <laughs> oh, uh, the herringbone pattern of the cloth, uh, pro shroud people, I don't think we can prove this, but they'll say the red crosses are blood stains. There's also this little blood, um, blood streams here, which people will say well, that corresponds to the blood belt that we see on the shroud of Turin. Um, so yeah, I think based on my memory, that's it for the, the kind of initial positive case that I covered in uh, my part two Shroud solo show. And I argued, look, the Shroud, is, this thing, the guy who made this probably saw the Shroud of Turin and used various features from memory to recreate it. Uh, Bob, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I, I would just like to add a couple items here. Uh, we have three women, uh, on the right, middle, and uh, on the left. Uh, on, on the left, the, the halo is, is a bit different. Uh, uh, but it's, it's interesting that in her right hand, she's holding an image of a face. You can see it here. There's the nose, there's the eyebrows, there's the eye, there's the mouth, there's, there's the uh, chin probably uh, with a beard. Uh, and it, that is part of a longer cloth. Uh, which then propagates back here. Uh, so where did this face come from? If you look here, there is a knife. There is a knife here. Mm -hmm. There's a disarray here. You notice the herringbone weave, which, which is representative of the shroud, is located here and here, but that weave is disrupted here. So this knife has cut something out of the cloth, and that something that was cut out of the cloth is the face of Jesus that was then given to Mary, so that this must be the Shroud of Turin. Interesting. I've never heard, so I didn't come across that actually in my own research, so that's very interesting, yeah. Yes, um, to, to me it's very obvious. Interesting, all right, cool. Uh, so yeah, uh, Bob, you, is that good enough like for your opening response? Did you have other stuff to comment on or are you pretty much on the same same board as oh, me? Oh, oh yes yes i'm on the same page with you uh, i i see that you know this is consistent uh with the shroud of turin the uh reddish uh, you know orange red it's it's probably a faded red here that they have but that's representative of the blood on the inside of the cloth uh so that uh, i think this is a good representation of the shroud of turin with the face being cut out of it and then given to Mary. All right, awesome. Well, so that's one side of the story, but as you know, there's always another side to it. So Hugh, I wanna bring you in as the Shroud Skeptic. Uh, you've written an entire paper. Um, I'll link to that on my blog. I read that in preparation for this. So, so what's the other side? Do you think that this is a cop? Um, I, I don't think we should see this image, either image really, out of context. Now I've published and you've seen, and I've seen more than I've published, literally hundreds of this scene 
in uh, Christian iconography dating from about 900 up to about 13, 1400, something like that. The visit of the three women to the tomb. There are nearly always three women. There is nearly always a tomb and there's nearly always an angel. And there's nearly always a shroud. Very frequently, the angel points to the shroud. Sometimes he's wearing a, he's holding a staff. And most interestingly, the lid of the tomb is nearly always slightly skewed. It's sideways on as if it has been twisted off the tomb. And there are so many of these that to, I think, an art historian, it would be incontrovertible that that big rectangular slab with the zigzags on it is the lid of the tomb. It's not the shroud and it's not meant to be the shroud. Um, now, when you mentioned the, 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 the holes, the holes are a real mystery. I'll, I'll agree with the holes being a real mystery. But did you say they were, they were certainly the same shape? Well, that wouldn't be difficult because there are four sets of holes on the shroud. And they, um, whoops, two, they, they're, they're, they're mirror image of each other. So they go like that and they go like that. So any four holes in an L shape are bound to get on the shroud somewhere along the line. But did you say they were in the same place or something like that, that they were? Uh, yeah, relative location kind of thing. Yeah. Well, of course, as you will see by just looking at the shroud, they're not. I mean, they, they are the, the shroud holes are here, as it were. They're certainly not like that. This one goes halfway across the shroud and they're big holes. And the three uh, long ones are uh, transverse to the shroud, whereas on the shroud themselves, they're actually longitudinal with the shroud. Secondly, we have two sets of these things on the Prey manuscript. One of them, as you so rightly pointed out, looks like that. And then just below it, we've got another one, which looks like that. Uh, and this is not L-shaped. Uh, and it's not on the shroud. It's uh, or on the lid. It's on the sarcophagus below. Now, I, I have no explanation for these offhand. Um, I've got some ideas, but they're certainly they're, they're not totally convincing to me, and I wouldn't expect them to be convincing to anyone else. They would be that they may be holes where the pegs that connected the lid of the sarcophagus to the bottom of the sarcophagus went through or something like that. I think the rather curious design on the bottom, which has got all those crosses and then a diagonal line of crosses and um, uh, and those are the ones who've got the, some dots on it. They're a clumsy representation of the corner of a tomb, a co the corner of a box. Uh, it's not a very good representation, but uh, it's there are other uh, illustrations of this exact scene, which are also not terribly good in terms of perspective and trying to get the design of the box right. Now, uh, and then the other thing is people people see some zigzags. Now, anybody who knows the design of the shroud such as the people who produced the pilgrim uh, badges um, when the shroud was first uh, uh, appeared in, in Leary, will know that the herringbone looks like this. It's, it's simply not possible to do it any other way. And if I was to ask anybody to draw some uh, cloth with herringbone design on it, I submit that this is simply not what they would do. You see what I'm doing here? Mm -hmm. This is not a drawing of some herringbone cloth. And yet it is exactly what they were doing on the Prey manuscript. Now, it's a moot point as to what it was meant to represent, but it certainly wasn't meant to, went, meant to represent herringbone. I think myself that it was meant to represent a... Um, uh, a, a particular kind of stone of which there are certain examples, especially in Byzantine epitaphioi, showing the uh, a sort of um, agate kind of design where bands, different bands of coloured limestone come through the the white, um, the, 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 the normal white of the limestone. And there's several examples uh, of that um, in, in Byzantine illustration. Now, I, I, I'm completely new to the idea that the shroud has a face that's been cut out. Um, but that would suggest to me, and I would agree with Bob if that's what he uh, was thinking, is that the shroud 
is actually this curled up bit on top of the prey manuscript and not the lid of the sarcophagus, which is what this bit is. Um, and again, the shroud, when it's drawn in these scenes, is nearly always drawn either crumpled, screwed up, tied into a knot, draped over the side. There's lots of different ways in which the shroud is presented in these um in, in these illustrations and it's never stretched out um in 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 a uh, in, in a rectangular configuration we could also say that it would be a little strange if the shroud that the figure of jesus is lying on in the top picture now which bit of the bottom picture most closely resembles that and of course, it's the crumpled up bit that looks like a bit of cloth. It's not the bit that looks like a sharp edged rectangle. Um, you're quite right. It's very unusual for Jesus to be represented as nude, although there are one or two other illustrations. Um, as for the four fingers, we might look at Nicodemus, who is pouring unguent onto, or if it is Nicodemus, either Nicodemus or Joseph of Arimathea, I submit, pouring um, ointment onto Jesus's chest. You'll notice that he only has four fingers as well. So uh, Byzantine illustrations were often drawn with only four fingers. Then I'd like you to look at the beards of those two gentlemen. They are uh, long and bushy and not unlike the uh, beard on the shroud. Uh, but we compare that with Jesus, who doesn't appear to have a beard at all. Now, it seems to me rather strange that someone who had used the shroud as his model would um, not notice what Jesus looked like, uh, which 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 is to me, I mean that's 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 too odd. So I, I don't think that the um, the prey manuscript owes anything to the shroud at all. But I'm very taken with Bob's idea of the knife, and um, I, I shall pursue that and look at it uh, in much greater detail on on higher magnifications. See whether I agree with it or not. But it's it's a very it's a new idea, and certainly that that peculiar face down by the side of the, uh, which I suppose is a Mary um, holding the unguent there. Uh, yes, is is inexplicable to me. And Bob has produced a sensible explanation for it. Bob, did you raise your hand? Yeah, go ahead. Yes, could I, could I give the opposing position here? Of course, yeah. Um, uh, uh, Hugh is saying that this is a sarcophagus uh, and, and that the red crosses are on the bottom of, of the sarcophagus. <clears throat> but but where the are the sides? There's no sides to this sarcophagus. There's no side. It would have to be no. looked straight vertically down. There's no sides to it. Uh, there, this, this is supposedly, according to Hugh, is the top piece of the sarcophagus. But yes. then it should be rectangular in shape. And it's not. The sarcophagus should come down to about here in, into a rectangle in all of the iconography where, where the where that shows a sarcophagus, you can see the sides of the sarcophagus, uh, and and the top, the lid to the sarcophagus, uh, is a jar, but it's rectangular. Secondly, uh, you can see that uh, in this image there is no thickness to yeah, this yeah. item. That that is a piece of cloth with no thickness essentially, and, because and a lid in in icon iconography, both the lid and the base have thickness to them this has no thickness to it and uh, uh, no 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 there are there are i mean literally I, there are hundreds of these drawn uh, made in statues and all sorts of things uh, and, and this is they quite often have no thickness um they quite often go off the edge of the page in fact uh, this one does have a um a bottom edge to it which you can't easily see but just to the left of the angel's hem uh, is the other end of the sarcophagus. Uh, it, it's not, I, I agree that the, it's not rectangular in the sense that the corners are not perfect right angles, uh, but it is it, it, it is quadrilinear. Yeah, um, yes. This but is, it does, it fits, this is a it fits perfect, perfect. Yeah, this is a, the, the angles here are a perfect representation of a piece of cloth with the top being lifted up. Now, I realize that in, in their artistry, they are challenged geometrically in, in <laughs> multiple different respects. Uh, and so that the, the holes here uh, are suitable, 
but the holes underneath it was uh, this is just part of their being challenged geometrically uh, in in this regard. Yeah, that's what I was going to say as well. Yeah, uh, that's, like, fair enough. But I, I I beg to differ. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, okay. Um. So so yeah. So on on my take, I agree totally with with Bob as well. Like we, this has been noted in terms of the the lid, right? This is the main difference. Is um, Hugh thinks that this is the the lid to the tomb. This is the bottom half of the sepulcher. Yeah, it's it's as much say it's not the bottom of the sepulcher. Those are the walls of the sepulcher. Um, I've seen them drawn. For example, that is an illustration of how some illustrations of the sepulchre have been drawn and that's meant to be the side and one end now i suspect that this is similar to that in that if there wasn't a lid on top of it it would look like this and where we go down here and this is the corner of it and we can't see this slope because the lid has been placed there. Oops. It's very much, it's a simple and not very um, accomplished cartoon. I think no one would uh, uh, suggest that it was it was a masterpiece of medieval drawing, um, but it's not out of keeping with any of the hundreds and hundreds of exactly similar um, drawings of its kind. It, it fits the iconography of its age perfectly. It, it doesn't because the the, the shape is different here than on uh, other iconography that I've looked at. Yes, it it's not. It doesn't fit at all. They don't have to be exactly the same. And, but and, it, and, the, and the other point here is that the herringbone weave on the top of this cloth uh, is a very good representation of the three to one herringbone weave uh, on the Shroud of Turin. Well, I think I've illustrated that in my opinion, it's not. I, I, I'm sorry, but I don't have access to my diagram where I've taken the Shroud of Turin and drawn these same lines can be followed on the three to one herringbone weave of the Shroud. Well, fair enough. Yeah, and, and it's we have Matt Child Fleur Lindbergh who also concurs with what Bob is saying. And on this front, so, so Hugh once corrected me because I cited her in general stating that the person who made this manuscript must have seen the Shroud. And I was wrong to use her as a, an authority as a historian or something like that, but she is a textile expert and she does think that this properly represents herringbone weave kind of thing. So that that's relevant factor as well. Um, I agree with what Bob was saying. One, one thing I'll just add in terms of the tomb, uh, one thing that many scholars, even um, agnostic scholars, so I'm going to be linking to an article by Tristan Cassid, Casabianca, who writes an article on the Prey Codex and he cites all of the scholarship uh, including where they are and about 11 features um, that, again, I, I don't have off the top of my head because the stupid document closed, but um, oh, anyways, he, he's, huh? he evaluates that. And even agnostics will admit, look, the, the two-dimensional effect here, you have it in the upper panel. Oh, you can't see my mouse, but on the upper panel, look at the tombstone there. You can see the two-dimensional effect. You don't get that on the bottom one. So that, that's another argument that even people who scholars who are agnostic, they don't know whether the manuscript was copied from the shroud or not. Um, even they kind of recognize that factor. Um, as uh, Hugh mentioned, the L-shaped holes in his argument, he doesn't have an explanation. He admits, look, there is something to this. It's a weird feature at the very least. Um, how do we make sense of it? And I think because it's in the same relative position as it is on the shroud, yet, yes, Hugh drew his diagram it's not perfect again this this guy's based operating based on memory and he's geometrically challenged in terms of the bottom ones he has to go around the red crosses um in terms of the the red crosses being uh on a on a same same thing on the tombstones i've seen hugh so hugh has provided proof visual proof that there are stones that have crosses on um, however, I've also seen proof of visual art depicting Jesus with red blood stains on Jesus himself in the shape of crosses. Um, so I, I would just kind of be agnostic. And, and the fact that they're red uh, in color 
could be suggested that, yeah, these are blood stains, but I wouldn't be dogmatic either way on that. Um, what else? Oh, yeah. So one thing I'll say that Hugh Ferry agrees with us is that these L-shaped holes, so some shroud skeptics will say, well, these are just decorative. Uh, or they serve some decorative purpose. Hugh Ferry disagrees with that. He would be on the pro shroud side and say, "No, that that's not." If you look at the uh, if you look at the, the 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 band across the throat of the lady in uh, the middle lady, okay. she has little holes which are clearly decorative. They're there for a purpose, and they are to decorate the top of her dress. But there's no way that one would put in just what is it for four five hundred four random holes and just just for decoration that that doesn't make sense to me at all so i agree with you there awesome that's progress um all right cool um oh one thing so one thing that we should talk about is we'll look at the counter features as well right because hugh ferry has mentioned well look at the guy's beard um he's he's um uh actually yeah before i get to that uh the nakedness so I have looked into it and uh, people have cited, it is extremely rare. The, the only time Jesus was depicted naked before, or sorry, uh, someone was depicted naked in Byzantine art before was, uh, wasn't even Jesus. It was one of the apostles. He's on a grill or something like that from what I've St. Lawrence. St. The St. Lawrence, think, okay. St. Um, Lawrence, I think, yeah. All right, cool. So, so from what I've read, the scholars say no one depicted Jesus naked until after, well after the prey codex or something like that so this this is a you know another feature that really speaks towards the shroud of Turin at this time um well, I, you, I, I i i agree that in this context um but he's almost always shown naked in baptisms um even to the extent of showing his genitalia sometimes uh, and of course adam and eve are often shown naked as well in medieval illustrations so um nakedness per se it it's um yeah it's unusual but it's not so staggeringly unusual as to be unique gotcha okay um and then the counter feature so i just wanted to give kind of so obviously there are counter features and stuff right it's not a perfect duplicate no medieval artist could exactly duplicate the shroud and i i think that there's been adequate responses to that um again i, I don't have them memorized and i don't have the document but for example, it's not like this guy's sitting there drawing it and studying the shroud. Just, he's basing it on memory. He saw certain things, certain things stuck out in his mind, like those holes um, and the fact that Jesus was naked, perhaps. And so he he painted certain features that were odd and stuck out to him, but he didn't get everything right. So he would follow the customs of his time. Um, so there, there is this at least counter uh, counter response to Hugh saying, well, it's, it's not not everything is exactly like with the shroud yeah it, it doesn't have to be when we're comparing artistic images and stuff like that it's still the point is that we have a sufficient amount of striking similarities that warrants the the judgment there i i by and large i think uh, it would be fair to say that i agree with that however if i was a uh probably Andrea Nicolotti or someone a slightly more skeptic skeptic or certainly more extreme skeptic would say that it's uh it's it's a little bit serving your own purpose to say that where there is a bit that looks as if it might have come from the shroud it's obviously derived from the shroud and where there's a bit that doesn't look as if it came from the shroud then that's obviously um a, a little deviation from accuracy now you can do that with almost any picture, can't you? And say, ah, yes, well, he's got this, so that's obviously from the shroud, and he hasn't got this. Ah, well, that's that's just a slight deviation, and you can do that with any picture. Um, so I, I'm not sure it's, that's a very strong argument, quite honestly. You've got to, in order to show that the that it, it's derived from the shroud, you've got to come up with with uh, sufficient characteristics that whoever it was must have got that bit right. And I, I submit that Jesus's beard is something which um, is very much uh, essential to Byzantine iconography, uh, especially as we can see here when he's wearing that halo with the with the with the cross on it. That's the sort of true identifying um, mark of Jesus. Uh, and so to miss his beard out rather suggests that you don't really know what he looked like. 
And that, I mean, that's far more important to my mind than uh, than the zigzag weave of the of the cloth. And how he could have got that bit right and this bit wrong uh, is a bit odd. Also, of course, there's absolutely no blood on this uh, on this uh, image at all, and the shroud is covered in it. There's no sign of the scourge marks. There's no sign of the uh, trickles down the arm. Um, uh, is it possible that he would have just missed that out, right. but remembered to? um put in the poker holes that 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 doesn't sound to me i mean that's why i, I think that's not credible i mean I, I can agree there's a difference of opinion there but that is my opinion gotcha yeah bob yeah my opinion here is that the beard is not missing uh if you look in the in the lower section down here we uh, we have the nose we have the mouth but this is not just the chin but but it's a short beard uh, on the image here and I suggest to you that we have the same thing up here. It's a short beard. It looks like there is some uh, effect up here, similar to what's shown uh, up here in these, but the beard is much shorter. That's all, not missing. It's a yeah. point of view. Yeah, I, I, I personally agree with that too. I, I do think that it's a short beard, but there's still, there's still the explanation. Like the Shroud Man would have a longer beard. So like Hugh can still make his, his argument and stuff. But again, I, I would just explain it as artistic. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm very happy that there are differences of opinion. Yeah. All right, cool. Um, again, I think we've covered everything. Um, is there anything else about the Hungarian Pre Codex that I mentioned in my Shroud Solo show that you guys would like to speak um, about? Or... No, I'm just going to have a look. No, I've got my forehead. No, I'm. I think that's all I all I could. Uh... Oh well, one of the things that you mentioned in your thing was that um, it would be just possible for radiocarbon scientists to stretch their date to 1150. Oh, yeah. uh, but I, I think that's, I, I don't think any, um, well, <laughs> as a leading non-authenticist, I don't feel the urge to stretch the radiocarbon dates to 1150. <laughs> exactly. And that that was total BS. Like I, I was just bending over backwards to help out the, the Shroud skeptics by, you know, they say plus- Yeah, five. won't you help, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> fine, fine. Uh, but, but yeah that he was right when, uh, i kind of said in shroud Solo show part two i was like well you know they have these this range 1260 to 1325 whatever it is plus or minus 65 years so let's take the lower bound 1260 minus 65 years and you get 1195 so it may still be consistent with the carbon 14 now that's not how you read the dates as bob's about to tell us uh, but I was just being uh, cheating for the skeptic. But yeah, Bob, go ahead. Yeah, yes, the uh, range of the carbon dating was quoted as a 1260 to 1390. That is what's called a two sigma range, which means that 95% probability uh, uh, that the uh, true date would be within that range. But now uh, th that was after you make the correction for the change in carbon 14 concentration in the atmosphere. The average from the uh, dates themselves was 1260 plus or minus 31, so that the uncertainty is 31. So that when you then take the range of 1260 to 1390, that's already two sigma. It, it, if you then add another two sigma below that, starting at 1260, you subtract 62, you get down to uh, uh, what 1198, but that's now four sigma away and no statistician would go that far. Two sigma is as far as you go uh, and stay within the accepted range of statistical analysis. And that's given by 1260 to 1390. Gotcha. Yep. Well, yes, yep. I agree with that. Just, I think, um, now this is a long time ago, but I think Hedges did actually go beyond two sigma. I think he went to something like 10 sigma and worked out the possibility that the shroud was authentic based on the radiocarbon proportions being correct. Uh, and it yes. was anyone could do that. You know, didn't <laughs> anyone could do that. 
But that, that's based on the assumption that the 1260 to 1390 was two sigma range, yes, which yes. it's not. Uh, it, th uh, that, yeah. that entire concept needs to be rejected. But obviously, no one would say that there was a, a, a zero point and then 99 zeros before another one probability no. that the shroud was was uh, you know was 10 sigmas away from the calculated that, average that whole process is is wrong awesome awesome cool so with that said um for the sake of my guests i think we'll end it at this point and this is going to be a, an ongoing series um i'm going to try and get whoever i can so we'll pick up um next time with my art history and numismatic coins argument maybe i'll throw in the sudarium because that was again in part two as well um, and just cover those two topics in the show, uh, rather than trying to cover four. Um, uh, but yeah, I want to thank both of my guests for, for being on. I hope you guys enjoyed your time. What did you guys think of the, the panel review format? The, you, did you guys like I think it was one of the most civilized discussions I've ever been in. So thank you both. Awesome. Very good. Awesome. All right, cool. So yeah, with that said, I will let you guys go. Uh, just so you know, the next show will be with Barry Schwartz. He's coming back to specifically give his master's course on refuting ordinary artistic mechanisms, um, the type that, you know, people like Hugh Ferry give and that sort of thing. So that'll be posted up either Saturday or Sunday of this week. So other than that, have a great week. Yes, thank you, thank, thank you Dale, for doing this. Uh, this is very valuable to everyone, I think. Absolutely. Yeah, it's a pleasure having you guys. I'll, I'll always invite you guys on for all of these if, if you want to come and that sort of thing. So. If I can, yeah. Cool. Okay. okay, yeah. All right, take care.